you're gonna have a beast, you're gonna love them, you're gonna call them your girls, and then you find out in the spring that they are all dead. And you're gonna do it every year. So, so you are in the right place. So it's my privilege to really tell you about beekeeping. Uh, before we start, this is only one hour, and I found out that what I want to tell you won't fit in one hour. So, <laughs> which is probably normal, but I'll try to be, uh, I'll try to tell you as much as I can in one hour and show you some pictures. It's more fun. You will not learn much. I just want you to understand a little bit what's beekeeping about. So you don't think you can just go to Mudrok, buy the package of bees and that hive and do what they told you and you're going to be beekeeper. You won't. It's a lifelong learning thing. Uh, so about me, my name is Peter. Yes, I do have an accent. And it's from Eastern Europe, from Czech Republic, so no, not Russian. Uh, and, uh, but I've been in uh, North America for a long time. I live in Canada. And I met this amazing woman here in Valley, and I'm kind of here in Valley now, and in Canada. And, and I do beekeeping for probably 15 years. It was a hobby. And how I came to it is that I was really stressed at work, and I always thought like beekeeping would be a cool thing to do, as all of you probably think. And, but I didn't think I can do it. And once I saw the movie, it was from Europe, and there is this guy in non-functional marriage, and he's fighting with his wife, and not physically fighting, and he's had enough, so he goes on the balcony, an apartment building. There's like thousands of balconies and everywhere, and he has a hive there. And I'm like, well, if he can have a hive in this, so I can have a hive. So I did. I did exactly what everybody does. I went to beekeeping club. And I found beekeepers, they are great guys, but they are a little bit weird. And they, I found that they don't really help you much. They kind of think, this is what you do, it's, it's okay. And then they talk this different language. They call things like nook and rearing, and it's like, well, I don't know what they're talking about. So I found it's very hard to find a mentor in beekeeping. So you end up on your own, kind of. So you go, you buy the bees, you do everything what I told you, and it's great. And I found it extremely relaxing. So I would come from work, stress from work, leading with people and whatever. And I could work bees. I could just sit down in front of the hive and watch what bees do. And it's absolutely amazing, guys. I fell in love with it. And I was like, this is a really amazing thing. Uh, that every bee, beekeeper, beginner, you end up opening hive like every week because you want to open the hive. It's a really amazing thing. You become part of the nature. You really open the hive, and there's these thousands and thousands of bees flying around you. And actually, they are not so vicious. They don't want to kill you. And if they do understand <laughs> that you are helping them, and you are not really, and if you are gentle, they are gentle too. So trick number one, don't be rushed. If you are rushed, they'll be rushed. You kill one bee by accident. You squeeze her. She stings you. Every time I get stung, and you will get stung. It's my fault, always. Just for guys, one thing, what happened, I had a bee once. I, you watch these videos, right? And there are people having nothing opening the hive. So I know my bees, no problem. So I did that. Well, the bee got into my pants. And I'm doing my hive, and I feel the bee, she is not just in my pants, she's in my underwear. <laughs> and I can feel her. Guys, it feels really uncomfortable. <laughs> And so what do you do now, right? So what I did, I have to finish what I'm doing. I walk away. I will not demonstrate how I release her, but I release her. She flew away. She didn't sting me. She didn't want to. So they don't want to sting you because they die. But the problem is when you squeeze, once you squeeze the one bee and she stings you, in the same process, she releases pheromones, and all the other bees can smell it, and they get kind of defensive because one of our sisters died. Okay. So got the bees, they died in spring. It was very depressing. Well being myself, I'm like, I'll start it over again. I'll get two hives this time. Got two hives, amazing. Uh, by the way, always start with two hives because now you have something to compare. So I got two hives, they did great, they died in the spring. Funny is that they never die in winter. They always die in spring. And it always looks like someone, some magic happened because they are in half of the work and you open the hive and they are like, they look like they are working, but they are dead. 
uh, it's not like they knew they're going to die. It's very fast. So again, I was depressed. So I said, OK, something's wrong, Peter. So I study. I volunteer with commercial beekeeper. I learn how to, roar or how to rear queens. And I found it fascinating. And I signed for the course at University of British Columbia, which is the master beekeeper course, which if I would know how hard it was, I would probably never sign for it. But I did. And I did pass. I did the national exam. So I am master beekeeper. It doesn't really mean much, guys, because there is a lot of master beekeepers who really don't know. I'm not saying I don't do know, but my whole intention is take a seat, guys. There's a lot of seats. Is I want you to be successful. That's why I do it. Uh, because if you are successful, I feel successful. So if your bees survive, I feel good about it. Uh, so we started a company with my girlfriend, Alison, which you're going to see the picture, and she's down there. Um, and it's a therapeutic bee. OK, that's our name of company, Good Bee Co. And the whole purpose, it's non-profit company. And what we do, we, Alison is a therapist. And we bring clients to hives, which basically most people, you tell them about bees. They are like, oh my god, I'm going to get stung. There is a fear, right? There is this anxiety, whatever. So we bring kids, usually, to the hive. We open the hive. There is thousand hives, a thousand bees flying around, and then Alison goes back with children to the uh, to her office, and they work on that fear to overcome their other fears. So that's the whole thing. It's non-profit. Everything we make go back to the program, and as part of it, we do school presentation. I go to schools and I just do presentation for children. I watch my language. I promise. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's really fun. I just like to teach kids where their honey comes from and what's happening in the hive. It's because it's very interesting. You will be shocked. People have no clue. So, and we sell bees. We have hives here. Um, we teach. Uh, we help people. We manage hives and so on. More about it you can learn down when you come to see us. I'm sure you will. So, that's Alison. That's our hives in one site, and this is the therapy place, which is very close to the Conrad Mansion. So that's what we do. Uh, and you can learn more about it when you come to see us down. So you are here. You are interested in bees, right? Because you wouldn't be here. OK, I'll, tell you, I'll ask you a question. Every time I go somewhere and people ask, well, and it comes to the beekeeping, and if I tell them, oh, I keep bees. By the way, guys, this is the best chick magnet ever. I mean, forget about Porsche. If you are a beekeeper, girls love it. It's like, wow, tell me more about it. So, oh, sorry. Uh, question for you. What do you think is the first question people always ask me? It's shocking. Get stung. Yeah, you always get stung. No, that, they don't ask me that, really. How much money you make from the hive? How much honey you get from the hive? It always starts, how much honey you get? Then I'll tell them, and then, how much money is that? It's shocking how we think of this as a money business. So if you want to have bees because you want to make money, forget about it. I mean, it's not going to happen. Unless you want to do the commercial beekeeping and you want to have hundreds and hundreds of hives, but then it's a full-time job. If you want to have it as a hobby, you will not make money. You take it as a meditation, that's what I do. Take it as something you really enjoy. You will get honey. You can sell, you can give your friends or keep it. If you want to do it to make honey, make a friend with a local beekeeper and buy honey. The only reason to do it is for enjoy having bees and do it because you really like to do it. It's amazing. It's an amazing hobby. It's not for everyone, but it's amazing. So there's no money in this business unless you do it big. You know where money is in? It's in selling bees because commercial beekeepers don't tell you, don't buy bees from me because they will die next year because they are bad bees for your wherever you are, because it's a great business. They die, I'll sell you new bees. It's great, it works. So this is Alison with our hives. 
And this is a uh, uh, hive in the middle of summer. We already took two boxes out of honey. Here in Valley, people always ask me, so I'll tell you, here in Valley, we get, you don't get that honey first year because first year they build a hive, right? But next year, you can expect around 120 to 150 pounds of honey. If I want to, from the hive, from the one hive, if I only want to make honey, if my whole purpose of the beekeeping is to make honey, in this in Valley, if I'm smart and I know how to manipulate them, I can make probably 250 pounds of honey from one hive. But then I feel like I have, my girls are little slaves and I'm just kind of, so I wouldn't do that. But, so each of these boxes is around 45 pounds of honey. So we already took two and these one, two, three, four, they are full of honey already. And we already took two and this is not even done. Here I want to show you, you can have a gentle bees. So this guy was living in my house when I had a, a bees in the backyard and he is extremely allergic to bee stings. When he found out I have bees, he's like, oh, 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 I can't. This is like three, four months later when he saw me working bees. And there was, again, when you see these videos, when people are like this with bees, this is like I call this extreme beekeeping, nude beekeeping, you know. <laughs> he is not nude, by the way. I just left it, there's a little bit of underwear there. He, he was going for nude, but I'm like, this is not necessary, just. <laughs> So, uh, he felt comfortable and he always wears the pen with him, right? So we are like, okay, if something happens, I'll do the pen. I'll be very gentle with the pen. I was not gonna, but. So he got out, he held the bees, there lots of bees around, and he didn't get stung. We sent this picture to his mom and she was in shock. And because his grandfather used to keep bees and they got stung all the time because you know, those bees they get were vicious bees. So, so my advice to you is, do not try to do that. Be comfortable. Wear the veil. Wear the glass. Don't get stung if you don't have to. It's for you, right? And if you are comfortable, you'll be calm. Bees will see it, and they'll be calm. It's all connected. They know when you are rushed. So this is uh, what we do. We did this hive, there is a, we, I love when children come over, right? So what we do, we sell honey, we sell equipment, we sell bees, we have to buy these suits, and they are like $80 each or 60 So the problem is, like, it costs money, right? So everything goes back to program, and so we are not, we are non-profit, I already told you, but we cannot get this uh, federal government, well, we could, but amount of paperwork was like, Okay, forget it. We just can't. So we are we are Montana nonprofit, but not like federal nonprofit, whatever. But doesn't matter. Uh, so th he was amazing. He found a queen, and you know he's so confident. He's just talking so great when you have a child like uh, just that. So this is a new queen style. This is like a few weeks later, and you see, I don't wear gloves, and. We put everything on the child. We don't want them to get stung. But uh, first session with children is we bring them in and we let them sit in front of the hive, kind of. And bees are flying around, and they just the next session will be they come and we open the hive. And if it gets to it that there is third or fourth session, it's a good day. We get children to put their hands on the bees like this, and. Actually, they do not sting you. There's a little trick. This is the same we did the show, like kind of presentation in our apiary for grown-ups, like for adults. And they all want to be dressed up and like, pfft, and we start flying. Half hour later, some of them took everything off and they had like hands on the bees and bees are crawling all over your hands. It's an amazing feeling. They really don't want to sting you. So uh, the trick is, I took the frame to make them comfortable from the hive with all the brood, which are babies, right? The, all the bees which are on that frame are the young bees. Their job is not to stink anyone. Their job is to take care of the brood, take care of the babies. When I walk with that frame away from the hive, not far, maybe like that camera, all the bees are somewhere there. These bees don't care. You can put your hand right on them. They will crawl over your fingers and hand. They don't want to stink anyone. But that feeling of that warmth and that, it's just amazing feeling. You can tell I'm excited about it. I can wait for the spring. 
Okay, next step, bees. Apis mellifera is, it means apis is bee, mellifera is gathering honey, right? And I put here, there is around 20,000 species of bees in the world, uh, around 3,300 in North America, and only 23 in the whole world are honeybees, the bees which will collect honey. The difference is that all other bees decided they will not keep queen alive and colony alive during winter. They just, in the fall, they make 10, 15, 20 queens and queens fly away. I'm sure you all saw yellow jackets in the fall and they try to get in the cracks and behind the window. Those are queens. And they hope that they're going to make it through the winter, that one from 20, one, two, three will survive. In the spring, if they survive, they get out and they start building colony. And you see how yellow jackets start their nest? It's little, right? That's one queen. She started. She lays the eggs. Once she has two, three, five, ten, they go bigger, bigger, bigger. And in the fall, it's big. And then they all die out, right? Then it's empty. So that's how they survive. Bumblebees, the same thing. Only honeybees decide, we're going to keep our queen alive. Well, for that, we need a honey. And we need a pollen. So that's why they bring all of that into the hive and they store it. And in winter, they, they, make, they make a cluster, which is like this size, right? There's probably 10,000 bees like that. And they keep the queen warm and they feed her with honey and pollen to keep her alive. And they feed themselves to generate heat. And then they generate heat by shivering, like you do. When you are cold, you shiver, right? They shiver. As they shiver, they generate heat. Most shocking for me was when I found out that the center of the cluster where the queen is, is exactly the same temperature as your body temperature. Isn't that shocking? It's exactly the same temperature. And as they move through the hive, like the cluster, right, they warm the honey and they eat it. And that's how they survive. Hopefully, they have a big pantry, they store enough, and they make it through the winter, in the spring, well not yet, but in the spring, dandelion is the first pollen. They start bringing pollen in. Queen is like, oh, there is pollen outside. She starts laying eggs. And the colony grows, and it may be 100,000 bees, right? And then they shrink again over winter. OK? That's what only honeybees do. There's 23 species only of honeybees. And they are not native to North America. That's most people don't know that. There were no honeybees here in North America. Yeah. So that's honeybees, but the, the other species that are non-honeybees, yeah. can they have more than one queen as well? And no. Continue? So it's just... No, they, in the fall, so only 23 will have one queen over winter, and they'll try to survive. All the other 20,000, they will, in the fall, make 10, 15 queens, let them fly, and hope for the best that they will survive. So bumblebees, for example, they go underground, right? And they all pollinate, and amazing is they don't compete for the pollination. It's not like we introduce honeybees, oh, now our native bees are going to die. They don't pollinate the same thing. We sometimes force our bees to pollinate things, like almonds. They hate almonds. They would never pollinate it in nature, because it's bitter. It has not enough sugar. It's like it's crazy, but you put the bees in this like, there's nothing than almonds. So they will pollinate it. They don't like it, but <laughs> what are they going to do? They, they fly around three, four miles. So that's, again, other thing, organic honey. Honey is incredible. Is there any children here? No? It's bullshit. It's not, it's not regulated. You go to Costco, you can buy organic honey, and it says mixture of Brazil and whatever probably coming from China through Brazil because there is, you cannot get Chinese honey, but Chinese sell it to Brazil and it's, it's crazy. And if you look at pricing, it's impossible. It's not, but whatever, that's not my thing. Okay, so honeybees came from Europe with Columbus. They were never here. So when you hear these stories that natives used to use propolis and honeys here, be, uh, honey and, and before, no, they didn't, because there were no honeybees before. Uh, so they came originally 
all bees came from Africa. Then from Africa, they got moved to Asia. And then from Asia, with Marco Polo, they got introduced to Europe. And Europeans, as they used to, they kind of take everything and try to make it better. So they start breeding bees, and they made them to what they want. They made them bigger, so they bring more honey. They made them genetically kind of breed them so they survive winter, and so on. Okay? There is few species. We won't go too much into it. There is a German, which is this dark one. Germans are great for winter. They don't bring so much honey, but they do bring honey. And they, they could be a little bit defensive. On the note of defensive, everyone wants gentle bees now. Right? Everyone wants the picture of the naked guy with the bee. Well, the problem is, if they are too gentle, they are gentle to you, but they are gentle to everybody else. And the nature is not nice to bees. So if they are too nice, they get taken over. You probably heard that people lose bees to yellow jackets, right? Uh, there's many things you can do, but Russian bees, you will never lose them to yellow jackets. And again, I have nothing against Russians, but... Uh, <laughs> this is Italian bee. She's kind of golden, and everyone loves them. They are gentle, they bring a lot of honey, but they do die in winter. So, if you buy bees from Mudrock, they'll be Italian. So what does it tell you? You are buying wrong bees for the area. Uh, and then there is this, which is called Carnolian, which is a bee kind of, which was developed more in Slovenia, Austria, Europe. Uh, they are kind of grayish uh, color. They are great for winter. Uh, well, I'm, we don't have time to, there's a lots of things to talk about, but those are bees I like. Because they are still carnolian, carniolen, carniolen, merifera carnica. That's Latin. Uh, the thing in North America, what happened, as we people, we are all kind of mutts here, right? We come from all over and we mix. The same happened with bees. We really do not have pure Italian or pure carnelian or pure German or then they are Russian and African and whatever. We don't have that because they all mix. But actually, our bees are much more healthier than bees in Europe because we don't do inbreeding. We let them to do things. So it's kind of interesting. It's a big business now to export our bees to Europe. We don't export packages. We export uh, basically sperm so they can do the artificial insemination, or we export bees, like queens only. Because you don't really need to export 10,000 bees. You just need to export one queen. One month later, you have bees, right? <laughs> Makes sense. It's like orange juice, concentrated. OK, <laughs> so that's about bees. Uh, you heard about African bees. Uh, don't worry about it much, because African bees, they're all African, really. So we do DNA. Right, we take the bee, we clip their antenna, and they found DNA, how much Italian, how much African, how much is in it. Now, shocking is, when you do that, when you go to Montana or Alberta, North, most genes in those bees are Italian. They have most of the Italian. You go South United States, they have Carniolan or they have German, more. Why do you think that is? That's a puzzle. Because logically, you would think it would be opposite, right? Yeah. But it's not. Why is that? OK, we don't have time, so I'll give you an answer. The, the answer is that in Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, whatever, we get the bees. Beekeepers, hobby beekeepers buy the package from Mudra, and they die. And they replace them every year, and they replace them. But all these bees come from California, New Zealand, Hawaii. They are all Italian. So in northern climate, because they are dying, we are replacing them all the time with the wrong genetics, right? So we are actually supplying wrong genetics to our location. South, they don't replace the bees because they don't die. So they have more German, actually, than we do. Shocking, right? Oh, okay. I have a solution for you. Talk to me. <laughs> okay. So that's about bees. Now, what's in the hive? That's most important. It's very interesting. There is one queen. 
And if you come down where we are, I have them in the little vodka jar so you can see them real bees. So this is a queen. She's female. She's the only queen in the hive which can lay eggs, right? So she's only one. People think queen, I mean, she makes all the decisions. She makes no decisions at all. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't want to be queen to be in the hive. That wouldn't be my thing. I don't know if I wouldn't want to be in the hive. <laughs> but, uh, so what she does, she's born, and bees decide that she's going to be queen. She's made from regular, this is an egg she lays. So old queen lays the egg. Queen decides, uh, bees decide, workers, we don't like our queen, we're going to make new queen. They're going to take this egg, and they're going to feed that egg with royal jelly. You heard about it, right? Royal jelly. They give it a lots of royal jelly. And that superfood makes that egg, instead of worker, will make it queen. That's the only difference. Then the queen gets born, right? And what they do, these bees, they are smart. They don't want to risk it to make only one queen. They make usually more than one. They make five, 10, 20, whatever. First one gets born. Her first mission is to go and kill every other sister there is. Uh, yeah, Game of Thrones, right? It's like <laughs> survival. So what she does, it's amazing. She gets born. She gets out of the cell. First thing she does, she goes and she's looking for every other queen cell where the queen could be. And she pokes it. She has a stinger. And she pokes that and kills it. Kills that. Then she finds the old queen, if old queen is still there, and she will kill that old queen. I mean, you would think old queen may win. She, she won't because she's already pregnant, she's big, she's old, and there is this new young virgin, and she goes and she's much more agile, and she, you, I mean, 99% virgin kills the old queen. And now hive is all hers. Like, she won. Well, now she needs to mate, right? She's a virgin. She stays in high a few days, and after a few days, she flies for the mating flight, where, I'll make it quick, where she meets in the air with probably, there's thousands of drones. These are the guys, drones. And she meets with them. She picks the right ones she likes. She never mates with drones from her own hive, which is very interesting. Na basically, Mother Nature, right? She, she will never mate with, actually, even from the same apiary. But so uh, she mates, the way she mates that she mates in the air, it's like big orgy. She probably mates with 15 to 20 um, uh, drones in 30 minutes. Uh, they all have this uh, short-lived glory. Uh, they fulfill their purpose in their life, drones I mean, but they all die because she takes their genitals with her too. So <laughs> they, have, they fly, they have this glory and then they they are dead. And then she flies back to the hive. It's amazing that she finds the location of her hive back. And you can have hives. You saw the picture when I have hives. They can be close to each other. It doesn't matter. She knows where to go. She goes back to the hive, and then she never leaves the hive again. She's always in the hive. No, she may if she swarms, but that's a different story. Make sense? So that's the life of queen. It kind of sucks. And queens used to live four or five years. Now they live usually around one year, if you are lucky. And its reason is the artificial breeding, artificial insemination, pesticides, and so on. They just don't live as long as they used to. I have a queen which is four years old now. She's my breeder. I make queens from her. She's amazing, and I think this is her last year. I will not. I will kill her gently and make her like a. That's my. <laughs> put her in the. Maybe something better than vodka. <laughs> OK, so that's queen. Worker, the same thing. Yep. So um, in this process of multiple queens in the hive and the first one that um, yeah. hatches, how do you harvest other queens oh. for purchase? Yeah, that's the most magical thing you can, I can do as a beekeeper. Because I feel I am, the, I am the one who is fooling them around. And I make them to make queens for me. That's amazing. That's, guys, that's the pinnacle of beekeeping when I fool the whole hive around and I make them to make 100 queens for me, or 500 queens. And I make them to make queens I like, because I use the eggs from queen I like, and I use the drones I like, too. 
if I can. Okay, let's move on. Worker is the same as a queen, but didn't get. It's a it's a girl, so that's a girl. This is a girl too. She has a stinger. She can sting you only once, right? You know, B. She stings you once. That's her stinger. She dies. By the way, if you get sting, biggest mistake people make, you find a stinger, like, oh my god, and you grab it and you pull it. As you grab it, you squeeze the poison, which is right here, and you actually inject yourself with a poison, right? So if you find a stinger, look at it which direction it is in. Use your nail and just push it out, right? And if you may be allergic to it, just take a Benadryl or any, it, it works. Okay, worker, it's the same, it's a female, starts with egg, gets born, they live in summer around four to five weeks, and then they die. The queen lays in summer around 2,000 eggs a day, so around 2,000 newborn bees gets born every day in the hive in summer. They live around, as I said, four to five weeks, and they kind of work themselves to death. In winter, in fall, queen knows, okay, winter's coming, she's laying eggs, they get, they, the bees are smaller, and they live basically four or five months. They live the whole winter, they are winter bees. But summer bees, four to five weeks, and we'll talk about it. And then, this is a drone, that's the guy, and guys, they do nothing. They don't do anything in the hive, they don't clean, they don't bring any food, they don't take care of babies, they just lay around, watch TV, and, and eat food which workers bring in. Great life, right? Well, it's not so great. As I told you, those few lucky ones which actually get some excitement in their life, they die right after it. And those others who do think that they're gonna find some virgin somewhere to mate with, and they wait, uh, in the fall, it's really a sad picture for us guys because they are kind of stupid because they don't stay in the same hive. They think there will be better virgins somewhere else. I know, guys. Grass is greener. Yeah, that's what they think. So they fly to different hives and then they try to get back in or different hive or whatever. Well, the workers in the fall, they don't need drones anymore, right? Because they won't make the queen. They don't let them in. They just stay there and they won't let them in. And so in the evening in the fall, like or late summer, you see all these drones in the evening line up on the entrance and they are kind of sad looking and <laughs> they want to get out and they won't let them in. And then in the morning you see them all dead outside and workers are, they don't care, they just go and it's amazing. The little worker comes up, pick the drone, they don't want mess in front, right? So they pick the drone, fly with him, you can see it. They fly a few meters, drop it, go back, pick another one. <laughs> so, seriously guys, drones, like, not cool. Not cool to be a drone. So, drone again starts from the same egg, but the queen decides, oh, when she mates, she has, she's mated, so she has eggs, right? And she has eggs for the rest of the life. Plus, she gets mated, she has other sac in her body, that's why she's so big, she's full of eggs and sperm. And, but sperm and eggs are separate, they are not together. Once she is releasing the egg, she decides, is it going to be female? Okay, I'm going to release the sperm. Is it going to be male? I'm not going to release the sperm. So it's basically egg without being fertile, it's going to be drawn, right? It's amazing. Like, I know, it's amazing. Okay, and then here, this is just a picture of the, of the comb. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and you have an egg, then egg develops in little larva, and once it's pupa, they will close it. Then they cut through and bee gets out. The problem we have now with bees, which was introduced in 80s, it's varroa mite. This is actually like, if you look at the bee, that's the size. It's a little parasite which lives with the bees, and it sucks on the blood, and I can go in how the life cycle works, but doesn't matter. It basically jumps on the bee, and it's there sucking the blood from the bee, and then it jumps on the other bee, sucks the blood, and other bee, and other bee, and the drones, because they are idiots, and they fly to other hives, they bring that mites to other hives, 
and so you cannot win. So if we have here in Valley 100 beekeepers, and there is 10 of them who has this thing, I will not treat for, bee, uh, for anything. You cannot win because you always get infection from that. Mites don't kill bees. Mites bite them, right? They get blood, but they infect them with viruses. And viruses kills the bees. You had a question. Well, I was going to ask you, do the drones have stingers? No, drones don't have stingers. It's quite amazing when I do the presentation for kids, I pick the drones because I know which one are drones. And I can bring them to the classroom and I can kind of see, oh, Lucy, this is Johnny. Johnny is my friend and I can put the drone in my mouth and when they're like, wow, and I can give them to kids and they can bring them home. And I don't care that they die, but so, <laughs> okay, I know. <laughs> Life of the bee, and I, this is, guys, this is a lot of information, I get it, but I just want you to know something, and we have only probably 15 minutes, and then you have questions. So, this is just kind of picture. Rules for successful, successful beekeeping, and I'll go through it quickly. You need to use a local bees from local uh, beekeeper and local queens. Now, local doesn't mean that someone has a bee like business here and all his bees are right now in California and Arizona. That's not local, guys. Ask the questions, right? Do they winter here? If they don't, those are not local bees. That's the worst thing you can get. So you can get a nook from the local beekeeper here, which is making big money in pollination in Arizona on, uh, on the almonds pollination. When those bees come here, it's interesting, you don't see bees like hives around much now, right? But suddenly in June, there are hives everywhere. Because they came from, they came from Arizona, California, they go on the coast, Washington, and then they, uh, they end up here for that six weeks, five weeks of the nectar flow to get the honey. And prior to that, they will sell you nooks. Well, it's really bad because those nooks, they take the frames from the hives, which has been, they, those hives have been in the almond orchard, extremely toxic, they get sprayed with pesticides, and they are, now they bring them over and they'll sell them to you. So ask the question. So local means local. That's why I said like they have to winter here. There's nothing local. And they have to winter outside. Beekeepers have big warehouses, some big operations, and they put them in this warehouse where they keep humidity, temperature, and they feed them constantly with syrup. They don't leave any sugar for them, uh, any honey for them. They feed them with sugar. You don't want those bees either. Okay, key bees where there is lots of flowers. They need flowers all season, okay? And if you don't have a flowers, don't be Darwin. Don't let them die because there is no flowers. Feed them. I don't like to feed them. I leave the sugar for them, but I mean, I won't let them die because there is drought outside. So I, I will feed them if I have to. It's just a sugar water. Uh, provide warm, dry, sunny hive. Bees came from Africa, right? They really like sun. They like dry. Uh, afternoon's shade is good because, you know, here in July, we can get really, really hot. If they are in the middle of nowhere and there is no shade, it's a bad, it could be too hot. They probably won't die, but they won't bring any honey because they are bringing water to the hive to make it cool. They made their own air conditioning. They bring water, evaporate it, cool the hive. Uh, suppress varroa if necessary. I'm not saying you have to treat varroa all the time for the mites, against mites. But if you have mites, which in Valley you will have mites, there's no way around it, you have to treat. If you don't treat, they will kill your hive. As I said, mites don't kill your hive, viruses kill your hive. Uh, and avoid synthetic uh, miticides or pesticides and use only organic treatment. And there is way. There is always way. Okay. Day of uh, life of uh, bee. Queen lays egg. Egg is there three days. Then it becomes little banana, little, little larva. Then it's kind of bigger, pupa. Then they cap it. On day 10, they put a wax cap on it. It's there. On day 21, B gets born. Then she starts working right away. It's not like teenagers, you have to tell them what to do. They somehow know right away what to do. So first, their job is to clean. They clean the cells after the, queen is, uh, after the bee is born. They go in, they clean the cell. Next is to 
feeding, nursing, tending to sick bees, whatever. Then it's the building the wax, right? Building the hive. Next is defending. Those are the bees in the front and they are guarding. If you have the hive, if you've seen it, every time bee flies in, there is other bee coming to see it. And they just kind of come close. Okay, you can come. And sometimes they start fighting. So now you know that bee doesn't belong. He's just coming to steal the honey. So that's other issue. And the last one, the oldest bee, they go out and they bring pollen, honey, and all the jazz, right? Make sense? And then they die. This is Alison. You will see her down. Smoker. I want to tell you because people always ask me, what does smoker do? It's very interesting. I don't think it does much. I think it's more for us as a beekeeper. In the old times, they used big cigars, right? You see beekeepers like having the cigar and whew, they, I think it just was a good excuse to, oh, I have to go. I have to, honey, I have to go do some bee, beehive maintenance instead of smoke. But no, there, is, there, there are a few theories. So first one is, if you smoke the hive, they smell it, and naturally they think forest fire, right? And they start eating honey because they may need to live in hurry. Oh, that's actually my rhymes. So, because they need to build the hive somewhere else. That's one theory. Once they start eating honey, they don't care about someone opening the hive. The other thing you smoke, they are guard bees, right? They are guarding. And their job is, uh oh, someone's opening the hive, problem. They start releasing pheromones. Well, if you smoke, you overpower their pheromones and they don't smell it. I don't know. I, I mean, you know, last year we had the drought. We couldn't use the smoker. And I, <laughs> the key is open the hive on a nice day. If it's a beautiful day outside, middle of day where all the old bees are out collecting pollen and honey, you are fine. And be gentle, be slow, right? Okay, treat or not to treat. Now, this is my rant, and I don't have much time, but I will go through it anyway. I hear from local beekeepers that 60% of loss is normal. It's not. It's if you lose 60% of bees, you are not keeping bees, because they are dying every year. It makes no sense. Now imagine you have a, and we already talked about it with some people here, uh, you heard about Hol Holstein cow. Right? That's the cow which was developed in Denmark and it's amazing for dairy. It, 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 it will produce so much milk that it's like three times more than regular cow. That cow, it's kind of like a Frankenstein, right? It's been developed over like 100 years. And so let's say you are the farmer here and you, want, you love these cows. They are beautiful and they are so gentle and whatever. So you get hundreds of them imported from Denmark and get everything. And you are in Montana and you say, okay, good. I'm going to make them tough. I'm going to just leave them outside whole winter, and I won't feed them. They will dig for the grass. Elk can survive. And just, let's just leave them. What will happen over winter? They will all die. And I'm sure you're going to have animal control and neglect, and you're probably going to end up in the court, maybe in the jail even. Right? And it, everyone would say, yeah, sure. Like He lets those animals suffer there and die in the middle of winter. Well, we are doing the same thing with thousands and thousands of bees every year. And somehow it seems like it's OK. They just died. There could be 80,000 bees in the hive, and they all die. And you let that happen. I mean, that's not right. So I don't know. It's not up to you to save the world by not treating the bees. You are actually doing something which is counterproductive because some other bees get infected. Right? You are spreading diseases. You are not keeping bees if they die. Nature overall is not nice to bees. People think, oh, they do so well in nature. They don't. If they would do so well in nature, there will be, there'll be so many bees here, we won't know what to do with them. Because don't forget, naturally, they swarm, right? Well, if they all swarm at least once a year, we should double the population of bees every year. Wild bees, we don't. So it tells me that at least half of them dies every year. So nature is not nice. Uh, hive, I always hear this. Which hive should I get? Should I get this hive, that guy, horizontal, that? There is no best hive. Hive is for you. Bees don't care. You can shake bees in the bucket and make a hole. They will stay there. Hive is for you. They don't care about color. Somehow beekeepers think it has to be white. 
I think it's because of heat maybe or all. they don't have to be white. They don't care. It's, it's the thing you don't want to make it too big or too small. In the nature, they look for cavity probably like this. Nothing bigger. When you see these highs, when people make like the huge highs, we fool them around. We do it. They don't want that big cavity. If they found a tree cavity, which is that big, they will seal it. Uh, lung strong, that's the hive I have down, and Wade has that too. It's been around 150 years. It's proven, guys. It's standard. It's easy to find, easy to build. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. It does work, and it lets you to manipulate bees and save them. So do whatever you want, but that works. The other thing is, oh, I'm going to do natural beekeeping. It's new trend. It's not new trend. 80 years ago, everyone did natural beekeeping. We didn't know anything better. 50 years ago, 30 years ago, before we start doing pollination, commercial beekeepers start to move bees around, right? We didn't even use antibiotics or pesticides. Nobody did. But now, because we are moving bees around, diseases are spreading so fast. And for commercial beekeepers, these little girls, the bees, are money. And it's business, guys. And it's amazing business. It's a lot of money. And it's not in honey. It's in pollination. And the other myth is treatment-free is good husbandry. Uh, I think good husbandry is to keep your colonies alive and healthy. That's your job. Not to let them die. You are not Darwin. Don't do that. This is the... Pupa, you see there are mites on it already. That's how they multiply. They go and they basically lay the eggs. It's kind of fascinating how it wor works, but they lay the eggs. They actually mate inside of that pupa, and then they get out. And then they are on the bee, and they jump to other bee. And this here is Alison with our frame. And this is one of our apiary. We have many of them around. And we bring clients to them, and we pick the good apiary when we can. And this here, you see Alison has a gloves and because it's, she doesn't like to get stung, but now she sometimes doesn't wear them too, but it's not a big deal. Uh, this is honey. You see the white stuff? It's honey. This is brood. This will be all workers. And there is a little strip here around, which is, uh, which is pollen and honey. And bees are smart. They want to feed these little babies, so they put the storage around so they don't have to go too far. And a few more minutes, I just want to tell you what one big myth is too about bees. They think that bees go in, they, they collect the pollen or nectar, and they fly to the hive, they crawl in the hive, they found the empty cell, and then they put it there. And it's not true. The honey comes in the hive. She, they have two stomachs, right? One stomach is like our stomach. They use it to eat. Another one is a storage. So they get their nectar and whatever in that other one stomach. They fly to the hive, and they meet with other bee in the hive, right at the entrance, somewhere close. And they, through their tongues, they exchange that, that uh, honey. That old bee, which brought that uh, nectar, gives it to the other bee and flies out again. This other bee, her job is to take it, and it's like an Amazon warehouse. Like She goes, and she finds where it goes and puts it there. And then it's nectar. Then they, ha they then have to bring it to a stage where they will evaporate water. They, they will bring the water content in that nectar to 18%. How they measure it, guys, I have no clue. But when it's 18%, they will cap it. They will put the cap. And that's the honey you want. If you get the honey which is not capped, it will, fer it will, it will ferment. And that's how meat was started, because they didn't want to... They use all the honey and it starts fermenting. Oh, let's make alcohol out of it. So that's meat. But they will dry it to 18% and then they will cap it. Honey is the only food in the whole world which will never go bad. We found honey in pyramids that tells you how old honeybees are, how domesticated they are. They are extremely domesticated animal. Now people think, oh, I'll get a swarm somewhere. They are wild bees. They are not wild bees. They are the same bees which came from Europe, but they somehow made it. The reason they made it in the tree somewhere or building for four or five years, they must be aggressive. Because if they made it there, they know how to defend themselves. The other thing, they may have diseases. 
So if you get a swarm, you don't know what you are getting. OK, I think this is the last slide. I think and I have enough of talking. Yeah, that's the last slide. So questions now. We have 10 minutes. We can probably go a little bit over, but not much. What do you use for a finish on your hives? OK, to you know, you, some people. Can you repeat the question for the camera, please? Yes. What do I use for finish on the hive? What you see on these hives is just a stain. Yes. And I use water-based stain because it's only to keep the hive so it doesn't rot. You can use just the wood. Uh, you don't have to treat it with anything. You know, you see those hives painted white. People just buy the house paint and paint it. I don't like it because it peels after time. But, so I use just the stain for decking or whatever. And you know, and when you go to the store and you tell them you do beekeeping, you get a good deal because people get something mixed and then they don't use it. And, but I use water based oh, and the reason for it, it's not so toxic. And I can do, I can come to um, apiary and I can do it right there with bees flying, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Bees don't care. We have some hives, which I have to take pictures, uh, which we got kids to decorate, which is kind of good activity. And they paint all over and we just use acrylic paint. It doesn't matter. It's kind of cool when it starts peeling and bees don't care. They go by location. So if I have this hive, you see that little hole? That's what they know. If I go to apiary, if I move this hive two inches this way, for a month, all the bees will land here and walk to the hole. Because they remember exactly where that hole was. It's, it's shocking. Like, this is a hive. Hole is here, let's say, in this corner. If I move it like that, for months, they will land here and walk. Then we will walk. Uh. Huh. Okay. Is there any kind of, I mean, for up here in our climate, is there any kind of preparation you have to do for winter or anything like yes. that? Yes. Well, OK, theory is, again, I don't insulate hives. I mean, I do, but people say, I don't. I let them. They need to do it. No. You know, when they are in the, I always go back to nature. I go, what they do in nature? They will never pick the box which has wall like this. They, they're ideal for bees when they swarm. They always look for something what's 15 feet high. So for us, putting hives here, that's not natural for bees. They would never go there. But we put them there. 15 feet high, and they all go, always go, if they can, to the tree cavity. And usually when you cut it, you find there is so much wood around. They have insulation. The hive inside is not like all the same temperature. It's a cluster, I told you, right? They keep it warm. But I insulate my hives because I make it easier for bees. If I don't insulate at all, they need to shiver much more, right? And use much more honey. And I don't feed my bees. I leave the sugar there. Most beekeepers take all the honey out in August and they feed them with syrup. Well, then over winter, they have the sugar, which is not the same as honey. I keep honey there. I know how much honey they need around 60 pounds of honey to make it through the winter. I leave the honey there. If I don't have enough honey, I'll take honey from the weak colony, put it in my good colony, because I don't, I learn, I don't keep my weak colonies over winter because then I'm disappointed. And uh, last year, I didn't lose the, any hive. All of them survived, which is unusual. But none of my hives died. And everyone was like, really? I'm like, yeah. I insulate them. The key is cold will not kill your hive. Moisture will. So when people let, and I can explain it to you down. We don't have time. But when you have something on the top, which is called inner cover, which makes space on the, on the combs, the moisture condensate, and then it drops on the bees. And as it drops on the bees, it freezes completely their storage, their honey, right? And it drops on the bees, and it kills them. So in nature, they don't have a space on the comb, right? Comb is on the top. They don't need to walk on the top. So I don't do that. I put a carpet on top. And I put on insulation so the moisture can leave, right? When the queen dies, does she? die in the hive, or does she leave in she, she could die accidentally, and then they will make a new, hive, new queen. They will just quickly, they know if I take the queen out of the hive, within minutes, they know they have no queen. And they react completely differently, I can tell. Really? No, no, they make new queen. Because now they can do it because they have eggs, right? But if they don't have eggs, and they lose queen, they are done. 
What do you use for organic mite control? I use formic acid and oxalic acid. In combination of those two, sometimes I use formic, sometimes I use oxalic. There is difference what they do. Oh, we have to talk about it later. But it's actually not difficult, and it works like charm, guys. I am really surprised that people are like, no, I will not treat. It's organic. It's in your food. Like it's, and it works. Okay. Hmm? I used to have bees, and I got stung so badly and had such horrible reactions mm -hmm. that I gave it up. Yeah. So every time you get stung, you learn to protect that area with more lockdown clothing, you know, yeah. and stuff. So here, the last time I did it, I had, I was totally, I mean, not one inch of skin could be seen. And I wow. on these leather gloves that are up to here, and I see this bee right there. She lifts her little butt, and she just drilled through these leather, thick leather welding gloves, dropped me to my knees, my arm swelled from here yeah. to here. So what you said, Benadryl is the antidote, that doesn't no, work No, that won't work for you, no. What is, can I, cause I, that's what got me out of beekeeping. What would work for me? You want, do you want me to be like a brutally honest with you? I want the truth. Don't, just forget about that's beekeeping. Okay. Why do they hate me so much? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I don't think it's, I think you, you got the wrong bees or you open at the wrong time of the day. They may be attacked by yellow jackets the day before. They were aggressive. I don't know. Uh, uh, the highs we set, I set for the therapy are extremely gentle, right? I mean, they are like, I'm looking for that gentle, gentle, gentle hive because children are coming in. And even then, we got kids stung. I'll tell you this story, kind of funny. They are really gentle bees. Well, Allison takes the kid over, first session, no closing, but just like the hive is where the camera is, and no problem, right? She comes to the hive, like, like that. Bees come right in the head of the little kid. It's like, OK, great therapy, right? So he starts crying, so Allison goes with him. But she is smart. She knows how to use it, so they they took the stinger, and the kids stopped crying. They go back to the studio. They, they glue it on the piece of paper, and kid draw the picture. And now kid is the brave and tells the mom, like, you know, I actually didn't cry. This is my stinger. Shocking case, it was great therapy. Because kid, basically, fortunately, kid was not allergic to it. But uh, they use it as, oh, you got stunned, but you are brave. You overcome the pain and whatever. You know, three weeks later, kid is in the hive, and it worked like charm. But I'm not saying we are getting stinks, like uh, kids stung on purpose. It was really an accident, which worked really well. I was like, oh my god, what happened? Alison didn't know that two hours before she went there, uh, there was a company working in neighborhood, and they broke the gas line. And there was a big thing, sirens. They were drilling, the ground was shaking, smell of gas. Well, when Alison came, it was all fixed. She didn't know, but bees were really not happy because ground was shaking, they can smell gas, lots of people, sirens. They were defensive. She didn't know that. But my advice would be, get a pen. You should have a pen, you know, uh, a, a pen on you, and don't do beekeeping. I really love the process. I know. I love you know, you are more than welcome to go and volunteer with us. More than welcome. Do, do you take volunteers? Oh, absolutely, all the time. Do you have a card? Or you it's speak? down where we are. We are there on the show. Yep. We have a card, everything. More questions? We have a few more minutes if you have questions. Peter, have you opened your hives this winter? No, not yet. Uh -huh. Last year, this time, I was already, I already opened the hive. I already knew this year, I can't open it. I wait when it's going to be like plus 40, plus 50. And give them some uh, patties? Definitely. They will need it this year because I don't think we'll have a, some uh, spring will come later. Yeah, because we have still snow and the first pollen is down the lines, which drives me crazy. People spray it with Roundup, right? And then you come to your hive and there is a pile of dead bees and your hive is dead and they are right in front because the first pollen down the line, they land on it and it's been sprayed with Roundup. And they die, all of them. They build, kill your whole hive. And knapweed is one of the biggest producers of honey. Yeah. Right? Yep. We're supposed to get rid of it. Yep. Mm. Oh, um, you mentioned that uh, just before winter hit, you lose about 60 pounds. 60 of pounds of honey. honey yeah. In there. 
When do you usually cut it off? I mean, how long does it take a hive to make 60 pounds? Of oh, I make them to make much more than 60 pounds, well, yeah. and I'll take it. Right. But I leave 60 pounds in the hive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On our farm, we have seas of lagoons, and we had hives, and I've noticed just everywhere there's bees. Yeah. And then we had a phenomenal nut crop, and it's like great. And then next, this last season, our hives kind of petered out. It didn't have many nuts, and not much on the lagoons. And like I'm taking all that feed out there, but yeah. And you know, my answer is I don't know exactly. I would have to see what happened. Yeah, I. What, in my opinion, what happened? You got bees, which are probably more Italian, and um, they are not really suitable genetically for this area. And then you probably got varroa mite. And what mites do, they first year usually bees survive. Next summer you're going to see that they kind of disappear and they won't make it over winter. The mites very seldom kill the bees first winter. It's always, always second winter. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad, yeah, but it's uh, it's easy solution, really. It's easy to treat them. Okay, one more question. Is there a place locally that we can get bees from? You can get it from me. Okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to sell my business. We sell honey. You can see us down and we'll tell you more about it. I mean, we sell bees. I can tell you how much I'm going to have because I still don't know how many hives and bees I have. I'm going to know in two weeks when I open the hive, I hope. Uh, we do sell nooks, we sell hives. The one problem is everyone wants bees in April. Well, you cannot get local bees in April, right? I mean, I, can't, I can sell you bees in April. I can sell you bees, but I need to put in the queen from other hive, which I have to buy, and I don't want to do that. So my bees are usually end of May, middle of June. Okay. What are nooks? Nooks? Yeah. Nooks? I'll show you down. Okay.